Good afternoon, everyone. We lost one right off the bat. <laughs> Oh, here we go. All righty. Michael, Penny, Zach, Okie doke. Very well. How's everybody doing? Good. <laughs> All right. I'm going to give this like one more minute and I think we will do our thing. Okay, well, I'm gonna start. It is what it is, okie doke. Let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get this thing going. All right, so this is our last class period before dun, 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 spring break. So I want to cover just a little bit on uh, composition and shot design with you folks before the holiday. I figure that's a nice light topic to end on a good note. And then when we come back, it looks like in terms of this class, the um, uh, the last week of school, is going to be um, Monday the 20, is it the 27th? Let's see here. I think I got a calendar buried in here somewhere. Where is it? No, I thought I had a calendar in here. Well, let's see. Let's look at my, uh... okay. So we are here and then you guys are off all this week and then we have one week after uh spring break and then this is the last class day so that's the 26th and it seems to me that one class period might not be sufficient for review how do you guys feel about that does anybody have an opinion on that would would it be uh, a good idea to use the week that you guys return from spring break as a review. It's only Monday, it's one day. And then we would have two Mondays to review basically. So we could do pre midterm on uh, the, what is it? The 18th or the 19th and then post midterm on the last day of classes. How does that sit with everybody? Because I don't know if it's worth um, uh going into a new topic in the last week of school like that uh first of all um i know i i know how i would feel coming back from spring break and having one week of classes and then the semester was over i think i'd be mentally checked out already myself so uh if you guys are anything like me um that i, I kind of feel like that's a bad time to introduce new concepts I was going to do, um, I was going to talk to you about camera movement, but um, that's a conversation that I can have more fully and in depth in cinematography too, for those of you who are, um, you know, keen to these topics at all. And those of you who aren't, um, modes of camera movement like dollies and cranes and jibs and so forth are probably, you're probably going to forgo all of that um, and defer those choices and decisions to cinematographers that you're working with, um, particularly if you're a director. So I'm thinking that um, composition and shot design is a better topic to sort of spend time doing this week and then uh, we can uh, go right into review. So if I have a show of hands, uh, those of you who are keen to that idea, 
what do you think? I mean, am I on the right track here or does it really concern any of you that, um, you know, there's not a lot of time for review? I got a thumbs up from Estefania and from Kiera and from Gabby. So, and I think Zach already gave me the, oh, you're saying you don't know? Are you up in the air? You'll, you'll roll with the rest of the crew. I got a thumbs up from Penny as well. Welcome, Penny. I think this might be uh, your first time at a live session. If I'm mistaken, uh, please excuse me. Um, okay. Then I think uh, by virtue of the quorum, uh, and let this be a lesson to those who never attend the live meetings, um, you don't get to vote. So <laughs> the quorum has spoken, and we will have review after we get back from uh, the midterm break or the, what do you want to call it? Spring break hiatus. Okay, good. Well, that bit of business is out of the way. So let's talk about, let's talk about composition and shot design then. And this is kind of a fun topic because I think you guys already have a strong sense of this. Um, although, you know, looking at some of the homework assignments, I don't see I, I know that you know this because we are surrounded by, we are steeped in media constantly in, in every aspect of our lives. And therefore you're constantly being subjected to compositional arrangements. Um, you're constantly um, bombarded subconsciously with pattern, repetition, hierarchy, proximity um, in the advertising, billboards, um, videos, commercials, um, you know, even the menus at the, you know, McDonald's are, are compositionally designed to entice you to think more about those food choices and to buy food from them and not from someplace <clears throat> healthy. Um, so I think this is something that's inherent to you and I just need to awaken your awareness of these concepts. So it should be fun from that respect. Uh, before I jump in, though, one quick PSA. Um, we will be having Cinematography 2 in the fall. Unfortunately, as I learned this morning, it appears that the class is already booked up. So um, I encourage you, if you're interested in the fall semester, to hop on the waiting list in case people jump off. Um, and if you can't get in, um, we will offer it again next year. Um, cinematography 2 is where I deep dive into some of the concepts that we have looked at this semester. And then I uh, add additional topics to talk about and show you things from the point of view of working on set because I use the, uh, the film studios at UCF on campus as my lab. Uh, and we go into the soundstage and we do stuff with hands-on and with stop and go rehearsal and with discussion and Q and A and and the, and the like. So if you're interested in these topics and if they have been um, uh, stimulating to you, inspiring to you, or you just wanna learn more, um, I encourage you to look into cinematography too. Okay, today is composition and framing followed by a little, a little bit by shot design. So what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about very quickly a con, you know, we're going to expand the conversation we have started already about what makes our our videos cinematic. Okay, um, I want to add a conversation, a voice to that argument from Michael Chapman today. Um, he was longtime uh, DP, uh, collaborated with Martin Scorsese. Martin Scorsese. Uh, he died um, last year, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, we mourned his passing, the industry mourned his passing last, uh, last summer, I believe. And, um, he is, uh, he's responsible for a lot of the, um, classic movies that we, that, that many of us teach from to this day. So, uh, I'm going to hear a quick snippet from him. Uh, and then I want to talk to you about some elements of composition, repetition, patterns, convergence, horizon relationships, rule of thirds, and so forth. Um, and then a discussion, a discussion that will have to bridge two courses. We'll start this conversation about shot types in this class, and then we will pick up the topic in Cinematography 2 when I expand the conversation into a bigger uh, consideration of what shots you pick and in what orders you pick them and use them 
when you are covering a scene from a narrative so that you introduce um, story context and flow to the visual images uh, to go along with performance and dialogue to really emphasize what's going on in a story. Um, so coverage will be a cinematography two concept, but the roots of that uh, discussion will start here today. And then uh, I think that pretty well covers it. Um, and then I'll have some examples uh, to show you. And I want to see if you can pick up on some of the design elements that we've spoken about. I have a, a series of snippets from uh, the TV series, um, uh, uh, Mr. Robot. So we'll take a look at some images from that and see if you can pick up on their compositional plan. All right, so here's something quick from Cook Optics TV uh, featuring Michael Chapman. And just sit back and enjoy this. It's very quick, it's only about three minutes. I always say that, that um, cinematography doesn't have to be beautiful. Whoops, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> I always say that, that um, cinematography doesn't have to be beautiful, it has to be appropriate to what your eyes see. And I don't know whether I used this example yesterday, but the most, uh, most obvious example is, suppose you're telling a story and uh, you have a, you focus on a man's face and he's looking past the camera and he his just, his face is just radiant with emotion and love and sexiness and everything and you cut around to what he's looking at and what he's looking at is a beautiful woman lying on the bed whether nude or not nude doesn't matter now there the image should be beautiful it should the lighting should be soft and lovely and coming in through the window through the soft draperies and she should look gorgeous and the whole thing should look beautiful that's the point is her beauty and the, and his love and it should be beautiful then cut to six months later they're having a furious argument in the back of a taxi. And she's saying, you son of a bitch, you burn, and he's going to hit her and slug her. Now, should that be beautiful? Of course not. It would be counter, and it would be counterproductive. It would be absolutely against what the scene is trying to say. So the cinematography has to be at the service of the story and of the imagery, not, and not just self-consciously itself. Visual storytelling is all around us now much more than it ever was i mean you know your, your cell phone and, and hundreds of channels on uh not just the, the main channels but all sorts of I mean, there's there's visual imagery and storytelling of all kinds everywhere all around us surrounding us so nobody can escape the idea that there's such a thing as visual storytelling and that everybody does it i mean everybody does do it you know um so that they are far more conscious, I would assume, that young people vaguely interested in anything like that are infinitely more conscious of the possibilities and the, and the, uh, and the existence of this world. You know, if you grew up in a small town in Massachusetts, you had no idea, those in my day, you had no idea that there was this world of, of visual storytelling, of movies that was done by people, you know, it didn't, didn't, seem, didn't seem real at all. But now it does, and you know, anybody, anywhere can uh, make a movie on a cell phone. And in fact, the most uh, vivid images I think that we see now are things that non-professional people have taken on their cell phones of atrocities and bombings and God knows what and hurricanes and earthquakes and things. You know, those are the, those are the images which I think you can't turn away from. And they're not shot by professional cinematographers, they're shot by your grandmother, you know, but the imagery is there and it's very powerful. So, so anybody growing up and thinking of, of a career in the movies knows that that career exists and that, that, as I say, that looking and recording what you see exists all around you. Okay. So that's Michael Chapman, ASC, American Society of Cinematographers. And so he's talking about, um, he's talking about the language of cinema. So how many of you are familiar with the term literacy? What does literacy mean to you, Gabby? To be able to read and understand what you're reading. Yeah. I, um, anybody else got a, a notion of literacy? 
in whatever in narrow or broad context. Well, if we simply go with the notion that's been offered, which is the ability to read and understand uh, the printed word, then what we're doing is we're creating a very narrow scope for um, the realm of communication. And so what's really important and, 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 and maybe a breakthrough in your thoughts about cinematography in general and maybe and maybe in a broader sense in your in your thoughts about filmmaking is to think about um, visual images think about cinematography as a form of literacy okay so if you see a very provocative movie right um, and you you go to the theater with some friends and you see a very pr provocative movie. And then after the film, everybody sort of files out into the hallway. Um, and on your way out of the theater, you know, you share a brief conversation or a, um, a debrief with everybody about what you saw and how you felt about the film, right? And so some people are gonna say they liked it. Some people are gonna say they didn't like it. Some people might have a basis for their opinion right away. I liked it because dot, dot, dot. I didn't like it because dot, 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 right? And so there's a criteria that you can use, all right? Some people have a very simple criteria. Well, I only like certain kinds of movies or I only like rom-coms. So from that point of view, it was similar to some things that I've seen that I really liked. It wasn't as good as some of my favorite films, but at least it had those elements that I can relate to. And therefore I think the movie was okay. Uh, other people might say, I just love a lot of action or I love a lot of sex or violence or whatever. And this film had all of those things. So I really liked it for those reasons. And somebody, you know, someone else may offer, well, you know, I was looking at the cinematography and I realized there was a lot of shots in there that reminded me of certain kinds of ideas or themes. And some of it was very similar to another movie that I really like. And I I noticed in the credits that the cinematographer is the same for both films, the one I enjoyed previously and the one I just saw. And I can draw some correlations between the quality of the images. And I felt like the images spoke to me on a certain level that helped me understand the story, okay? That I think is film literacy at, this, at that point, right? You are, you're taking tenets from the study of filmmaking and you're taking informed, um, not biased, but informed preferences that you have based on the study of uh, imagery and the rhetoric of imagery. In other words, themes that are represented by visuals, messaging that might be inherent in certain visuals, and how the assembly of those types of images can create a more meaningful uh, experience for a moviegoer than simply the plot or simply the uh the exposition, the performance, right? Uh, at that point, I think we're talking about literacy. We're talking about comparing principles and um, examples and um, philosophies and knowledge about filmmaking that are incorporated into the film itself and the discussion about the film. We start using a language that is fairly unique. Um, and so like any language and like any form of literacy, we're going to have certain rules or guidelines, if you will, that we, that we try to follow that have been perfected over time. They have been proven uh, effective with audiences. Um, they, have, um, they have formed the basis of a visual lexicon uh, for filmmakers. You guys understand the, the term lexicon? like um, a glossary or an index or a, a volume of relevant terms and, and concepts to your specific discipline, right? So we start using these things in the assembly of our images. Sometimes we do it subconsciously. Sometimes we do it out of pure muscle memory, having done it over and over and over again, using the same things we know work with audiences and it becomes part of our, our, our visual style. Uh, and some stuff is done experimentally, meaning we learn a concept and we try it for the very first time. We try to apply that 
uh, what we've learned to our next project and see how it see how it comes together. Um, so we're we're practicing a literacy here. We have a, a language of our own. We have terminology of our own. We have communication and and relevant meaning through subtext. Um, we don't rely on direct expository dialogue to to um, reveal the tone of the narrative. We can do that with visuals, right? So this is the framework for this conversation today, which is what are some of these guiding principles? And you know, let's let's identify them. You probably have been aware of all of these at one point or another, but you just maybe haven't put a finger on it or you haven't stop to think about these things exclusively as concepts that might contribute to your own creativity. Okay, so I'm going to identify five elements of comp of composition. You could argue that there are more and there probably are, but these are some five that I found find particularly relevant. Um, they're five that I uh, use all the time. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, and see how it resonates with you. So if I were to identify those concepts, they would be pattern, repetition, and I'm kind of lumping them together because pattern would involve similar objects of similar um, size, shape, comparatively speaking, that would represent a pattern uh, through repetition, okay? Uh, then balance or symmetry, is it in balance or out of balance? Is, is, if it's balanced, it's symmetrical. If it's out of balance, it's asymmetrical, right? Um, texture. Lines, leading lines. So lines that converge, lines that uh, expand the frame, lines that lead us in a particular direction toward a focal point, toward a horizon. Um, and then depth of field. And we've kind of talked at length about depth of field. So we'll just cover that last with an, oh, by the way, depth of field, you know, and you can think about that uh, as part of your compositional repertoire. So that's why I gave you guys an assignment to use depth of field purposefully as a compositional element to see what your notion of composition was and how you might apply something like depth of field, something esoteric like depth of field to a visual image. And I'm, I'm seeing mixed results. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted, I thought that this would be an important class today. So let me now introduce you to John DeBorman if I haven't shown you John already. And I think I have really early in the semester. Um, but he's going to talk to us really quick, also from Cook Optics TV. Uh, he's going to talk to us really quick about composition and framing as it has had relevance to his own career. Oh, that's not working. Let me see, I might have turned that off by mistake. Did I turn off the sound? No, I don't. Well, yes, I did. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. <clears throat> Let's try that again. It's something that I think is absolute pivotal to good cinematography and good films is the use of the frame. A frame cannot just be a representation of just what's in front of you. It's got to have three dimensionality. It's got to mean much more than what it what it's shown. And I think I constantly have to think every time I'm doing a film, so how could I make this image more poetic? How can I say more about the state of the emotional state of that character in this film? God! 
And there's an example in, in an education, for instance. And it's terribly simple, and people just say, oh, well, you know, that's obvious. But it's a young girl, Kerry Mulligan, who's being driven by this man that she doesn't really know. She's 18, he's 30. She doesn't know who he is, particularly. Uh, and But he's exciting. He's something new. She's come from a very structured background with her parents from the post-war era. And he's driving her in this old Jensen, I think. And the car stops and he gets out of the car and goes across the road and uh, sees this black family across the road. She's observing all this. We could have shot that very conventionally. But what seemed to be more poetic and simple was we're really the scenes about her and what she's reflecting on who this person is and what he's doing. And so the next shot is her sitting in her car looking at the scene. And the car window is closed. So it's just a reflection of this black family with him reflecting in the glass. But she is in, in the, just behind it. But you see her clearly enough and you see that she's thinking about, so you're creating a superimposition in reality, in, in the real world of what was happening. And, uh, and then it's just a question of using the focus puller. And I think focus pullers are underestimated in the film, in the film game. They can be incredibly important at, at knowing when to pull focus. Terribly simple, but there's poetry and it's done in such a simple way. It's not a question of looking one way, looking back and looking the other way and looking back. It's all done in one image. So it's concise, but it works in a very, very gentle way. And I think, you know, it, it can happen through the choice of locations. It can be, it can happen through all sorts of things, but it is absolutely important to find ways of actually creating scenes that imply more than the scene itself. You can over-edit films, and often they are over-edited, I think, where you're, you're just, you're telling the audience what you're meant to be thinking about certain things, as opposed to leaving it slightly wider and let the people decide which, are they looking at the reflection in the back or are they looking at the foreground or what exactly what their emotion is and who are they with. And I think uh, that's what I'm implying that, you know, I love doing that. I, you know, that this is something that was in Made in Dagnum, but you know, there are lots of films in which um, I've tried to do that. Okay. So, I think that's a really good conversation that he gives us uh, with regard to composition and framing. Um, and the notion that um, he's talking about a lot of weighty concepts. So he's talking about, um, and I touched upon it in my opening statements, he's, he's talking a little bit about Gestalt theory in that, you know, you have a script, you have actors who are performing, you have a, di a director who's interpreting through direction. You have a cinematographer who's creating visuals that accompany the performance and the expository dialogue. And the sum total of all of those things equal a greater notion than we get from any one of the individual parts. Okay. And that's a really important way of looking at filmmaking. Um, we start with an idea, a premise, right? And then we have all of these modes of um, expression that when we combine them gives us the sum total of our point um, with meaning on different levels for different people in our audience based on their level of engagement. Um, I think it's a really important thing to think about because there's a, there's a huge amount of difference between applying these concepts to uh, your images. And I mean, all of the images. So a lot of you, um, are looking forward to making 
your capstone films and your films for your BFA. But when you turn in a homework assignment, it almost looks as though you haven't put any thought into the images at all. Uh, they're just sort of getting the assignment done instead of taking that as an opportunity, yet another opportunity to practice your film literacy by exercising some concepts, some rules, some tenets from physical production and applying them to your images, right? So you'll get a prompt from an assignment like, um, you know, create a shot that uses a focus pull uh, as a compositional uh, mechanism to lead our eyes through some dramatic point that's being made within the frame. Looking at a watch, looking, you know, actor turning, looking at a clock on the wall and showing a pull from the actor, you know, over the actor's watch onto the actor's eyes, looking at the time on the wrist, and then looking at whoosh, the, the clock on the wall, right? Show me a focus pull that has some dramatic context. And it's still not resonating with some of the people that are turning in these assignments. It's just, you know, I'm seeing these things that um, are indicating that either the concepts are not hitting home or that there is a, some kind of a disconnect between the concept as you understand it and uh, being able to apply it to the work that you're doing, right? As filmmakers, if we use our knowledge and apply it to our images, we start doing this thing that John DeBorman is talking about. Um, he's talking about the audience deriving more meaning from the sum total of visuals, performance, and script than any one of those individual parts could express by themselves. Okay. It's also interesting, you know, he's talking about doing that shot in the window of the car. And that's a really good example of um, uh, linguistic relativity. Okay. It's something we talk about um, in the study of rhetoric. And that is that you know, different cultures might have different meanings or place different emphasis on different kinds of words. He does use the word thinking, right? But in the beginning of his discussion about lensing that shot and figuring out how to compose that shot, he uses the word reflection in place of the word thinking. And when he did that, because he's very English, when he did that, I think the correlation between the notion of reflecting as a thoughtful um, analysis, internal analysis, had a dual meaning. Reflection meaning thinking, reflection meaning visually seeing the manif manifestation of a physical object in the shiny surface of the automobile, okay? And, it, and, and in that moment, his notion of composing that shot became, instead of looking directly at the uh, the man talking to the family on the street corner, uh, we're going to look at it as a manifestation of the girl in the car trying to interpret the actions of the man who jumps out of the car to talk to the family on the street as an aspect of her own internal thought process. And the word reflection was the synthesis. That was the crux of the, the, the concept of the shot. She's thinking, refle AKA reflecting, and she is, we see her and the reflection of what she's thinking about in the same frame, okay? That's a level of complexity that is generally not seen in student films, but it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> okay, let's take our first, uh, anybody have any thoughts on that any, before I jump into this other thing? Um, did I lose anybody with what I just said? Or does anyone have anything to add to that or question? No, I can move on. Okay. All right. So let's take our first uh, criteria here, pattern and repetition. And so I've selected um, the uh, Bramante staircase, the Vatican stairs, okay, in Rome. If you look at this image, you see right away uh, it's reminiscent of a lot of things. It's reminiscence of a nautilus shell, maybe, concentric rings, um, repetition of circular patterns, right? 
um, concentric pattern leading from ultimately from somewhere outside of this rectangular frame. And it's not likely that this was the original frame, by the way. It's more probable that the that the image, the original image of this shot was in square format from a, uh, a large format still camera that shoots a negative far bigger than we would shoot in our regular 35 millimeter cameras. It'd be a little bit like shooting IMAX instead of shooting super 35 millimeter film for a movie. All right, the six by six frame is a square format. Therefore it has an equal length by equal height in terms of its original aperture. And then we can crop any sort of rectangle out of that origination that we want. So it's likely that this composition extended all the way to the top of the stairs, either at 12 o'clock or probably at 11 o'clock over here. And then in the square format, it just goes around and around and around all the way to the bottom where there is a, uh, a water fountain, okay? Um, and then of course, this, this horizontal composition was cropped out of that six by six composition in order to offer another layer of complexity to the repetition. Okay, that's the, the, the notion that detail exceeds outside of the frame. It's very sort of organic in that way. And it, re it represents a, you know, an expansion of the mind's eye by allowing visual details to stimulate the brain and then the brain recreates the additional detail outside of the constraints of the actual frame itself, right? Um, a lot of people prefer that kind of art. They find it very interactive um, in a lot of ways. In other words, what you put in the frame is very is very important. And what you choose to put in the frame is sometimes as important as what you choose to leave out of the frame. And as a filmmaker, as a cinematographer, part of your job is to decide what the boundaries of your frame lines are going to be. Okay. Sometimes when I ask people to shoot a wide shot, for instance, I get shots that look like they walked 30 feet away, put the camera on a tripod and shot everything they could see in the world in that direction. And then in the very middle and very tiny um, rel relative size would be say two subjects having a conversation at a picnic table. And I think, wow, yeah, that's a wide shot. All right. But what is it about that frame that was compelling to that person who comp composed that frame? In other words, what, do I, what is at the edges of that frame line, top, bottom, and side by side, that's relevant? The relevant items in that frame are the objects that have seemed to have any meaning to me would be the two people talking at the table. So why do we have all the superfluous detail that does not support the story of two people talking at a picnic table? Unless there was something relevant to that background, why put it in? Okay. So the way this thing is cropped is very deliberate. It's very deliberate. The final expedition exposition, excuse me, of this image, it was critical, at least to the author, that the literalness of the concentric circles need not be preserved. Okay. Does that make any sense to you guys? Here is an example from modern film. Uh, repetition and pattern, concentric circles. It's also got a principle in it um, that we're going to talk about here in a, in a minute or two. Uh, called leading lines. Every one of those lines of LED lights is in a row leading all the way back to the focal point, which is Luke, as he steps into that walkway, turns the lights on. He's looking for Darth Vader. I think this is the second, uh, the Empire Strikes Back. What do we call that now? The fifth movie? Um, he's looking for Vader and he steps up and he turns those lights on and all those lights go whack and lead us right to Luke at the far end of the tunnel. And then he walks through the tunnel, looking around and he exits frame right, okay? So this is a very, you know, it's a distinct um, composition. It's, I think, successful in creating that focal point, especially when we start from a dark frame and the only thing we see really lit up are these objects, these shiny objects outside of the 
entryway to this tunnel uh, before all these lights are turned on. And then Luke steps in as a silhouette, hits the button and bang, it all turns on and we see Luke and he walks through. If we wanna talk about leading lines, then we also wanna talk about convergence because that convergence is gonna take us to a focal point or the horizon or both. The thing that we might be um, leading our audience's eyes to might be on the horizon. Uh, or, or it might simply be a generic comment about uh, the way life leads us in, in many respects gently towards our destiny, which lies at the horizon where the sun sets. The difference between the world as we know it and the world that will be soon enough, right? And so when you see a composition that has lines that seem to be leading you uh, in some subconscious way towards a horizon that that's a very metaphorical image right and it can mean it can mean a lot of things but in the general sense it's a it tends to be a very hopeful image um it has it tends to be an image that speaks of um you know inevitability destiny um uh the life's rich pageant of things that happen as we move through it towards, you know, this unknown uh, event at the end of our time. Um, it has a lot of strong visual meaning that can be applied to your script. So if, you're, if your script resonates of those themes and you're thinking about ways to, to shoot the images in your film that will support the ideas that are being spoken by the actors or demonstrated through their performances or through the actions that they take, then you might be looking for ways for the cinematography to rise to that level of communication as well. Here's an example from Kubrick's The Shining. It has the same principle going on here. And now we have a focal point and we have a, a um, uh, in what we call an inclusive POV. So we see what, uh, what's this kid's name in The Shining? I forget. Um, we Danny. see what, he, Danny, we see what he sees, right? And he sees the ghosts of these two little dead girls, right? And all of the lines, the converging lines in this visual composition are are moving towards the vanishing point, which is right here in the center of the frame where the two little girls specifically their heads are located. Can you see that happening in this shot? If you take a ruler and put it up to your screen and follow, for instance, all of the lines, the perspective, the, the force perspective that we get from the panels in the door, the, 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 the toe board along the carpeting, the crown, the, the molding along the, the base of the, of the floorboard and the crown molding in the ceiling, the tops of the doorways, take a ruler and line them up and watch the lines that are created by that straight edge leading towards the horizon and they should all converge at a point. More, very, very closely, if not exactly to a point, okay? And this is a, this is a way of, it's, it's sort of, a, it's sort of a way of spotting the principle of, of leading lines and convergence in nature, right? Even though the hallway in the hotel is not nature specifically. But in other words, we didn't create it. It was supposedly a, you know, a building that already existed. And the cameraman went in and saw this long hallway and said, whoa, I got an idea for a shot. And, you know, uh, Kubrick and, and Alcott discussed this. And it's about Danny driving around the hotel every day to occupy himself while his mom cleans and his dad writes. And it's a very big place and it's very scary. And this kid sometimes ventures further away from the safety uh, and supervision of his parents. And when he does, the spirits that occupy the hotel are then inclined to um, you know, assault the little boy um, uh, psychically. Uh, by appearing to him and trying to communicate with him, right? And so how do you show that? Well, in one shot, uh, a moving shot using the Steadicam, they follow this kid on the big wheel all through the place. Uh, and they only cut when they cut from one floor to the next, because I think he goes up to like the fourth floor or something and he, 
he's driving around and uh you know the the steady cam is following him down the hallway he turns a corner and as he looks the big wheel comes to a screaming halt uh the kid pulls up and i believe he pulls up into a big close-up and then the reverse bang is this frame right here and in that one shot the director is saying look here this is the danger right here the two little ghost girls right you could have shot that a lot of different ways. This is very specific. This is very articulate. Okay. Texture is one of my favorites because texture, more so than leading lines, and in many cases, more so than pattern and repetition, although this is using lights to reinforce the idea texture is directly related to lighting and i love lighting for cinematography it is the thing that i did with great satisfaction and passion for my entire career film lighting to me is the ultimate expression of the photographic creative intention and the idea that depending on where you put your light you can elicit responses from your audience. You can also reveal texture, reveal quality, reveal shape, depth, dimension um, by the relief that that light creates as it rakes across the surface of an object. Like in this case, Edward Weston is showing us uh, a cabbage leaf. But if you look at that cabbage leaf, it it's kind of reminiscent of something, isn't it? In the way that the light is sort of grazing that vegetable and giving us all that texture and all that relief, we call it. Um, it's reminiscent of something. Anybody got any, any ideas? Something very kind of casual and common, but I think it's interesting. It looks like water. Okay, water. That's a really good uh, analogy. Any, I'm gonna say it looks like a person underneath a blanket. Person underneath a blanket? Yeah, yeah. I never thought of that. Yeah. Anyone else? You know, it actually also kind of looks like veins, like on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, veins. Sure. It's certainly well. I mean, those are actually veins in the leaf of the cabbage, right? <laughs> um, anybody else? To me, okay, I had a niece uh, when she was very young. Uh, she was very much a little girl and she very much loved being a little girl and she loved wearing a dress. And one of the criteria of getting my niece to wear a dress was it had to do something she called spin. So when she was out in the backyard playing, if she twirled around, she could get that that skirt or that dress to float up and spin around in the on the air right and that was a very important criteria for her and so when i see this cabbage leaf by edward weston i think of a cascading kind of like ball gown or dress that you know a very fancy woman would wear to a, a party or a, an event or something right and I see the folds of the fabric represented by the texture that is demonstrated through lighting on this piece of cabbage. To me, it looks like the folds of a very elegant dress, right? Um, and in that context then, uh, <laughs> not only does it resonate with me, the concept of cabbage, uh, cabbage as, as food, and it excites a different um, endorphin, you know, um, you know, the thrill of something very delicious that you can eat, but it also resonates visually with a lot of concepts, right? And then I, I think immediately of a movie that a friend of mine lit called The Phantom Thread for Wes Anderson, right? And this movie, this image is not entirely indicative of the range of visual um, splendor that this movie has to offer, but it's very representative of texture in its most luxurious form. It's, it's about a guy whose only passion in life is to 
design the most beautiful garments for the most beautiful women that he knows, right? And it's his love, it's his craft, it's his passion, it, it, and it has been the way he spends his entire life in, in this story, right? And so, um, of course, there's these scenes with women wearing these beautiful gowns, and there's scenes of, of him working with seamstresses and people and designing and crafting and building these, these, these beautiful garments for these women to wear. And it shows his obsession and, and how passion can become an obsession and it can go from being a very good thing to something that drives you and you almost become a victim of your own addiction to this feedback loop that you have of creation and appreciation and then and then on to the next right um and so the movie offers a lot visually it offers a lot in terms of um particularly texture the way the shots are lit are lit using light that strikes surfaces in a way that reveals a lot of texture in in the in the clothing and in the textiles and in the i mean even in the environments these these wealthy um european um townhomes where they've got um you know elaborate uh, furnishings and elaborate uh, wood trim and and uh, and 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 decor uh, all of which represents these opportunities for light to play visually to play highlight games. Um, very, very pretty movie. And then in some of this, in some of the clips from uh, the film, some of the stills that I have, these two lights in the image on extreme uh, upper left and, and mid to lower right are props, but it's interesting that they are, they are <laughs> deliberately placed, even though they're props a frame within a frame. It's it's a it's a scene of a photo shoot. Uh, the woman is wearing this the latest creation, and it's a scene of a photo shoot taking place, and it's for her cover image. And so the photographer has placed his lights, and the photographer has placed his lights specifically where they would represent the most texture uh, revealed to the camera. Okay, so if you were to if if the point of view of this image was uh, us standing behind the camera, if we were the lens uh, and we were to light that from the point of view of the lens, you wouldn't see any texture in the doors, panels, in the dress, uh, in, you know, in anything. You wouldn't see the texture revealed. The, text, the, the light has to come from obtuse angles from the lens, 90 degrees or more from the lens to reveal the texture and surfaces and, and objects. So the lights in the frame in the movie are in this exact correct position to reveal texture. And then the lights that the lighting cameraman himself, Mike used to light this shot are in similar positions, just further outside of the cinematic frame, um, which uh, it's, it's just a very interesting um, sort of visual that represents um, uh, life imitating art. <laughs> so I thought it was neat. Um, here's another example of leading lines and the metaphorical notion that, you know, the the distant uh, horizon beckons us on the long and lonely highway through life, right? All of the memes and, you know, tropes that come to mind are all deliberately um summoned by this image itself and and what it means metaphorically it can also translate into a composition like this though as well right so here are the same converging lines leading to a horizon that is somewhere behind the joker so this is from the dark knight all right this is wally fister uh but right in the middle where we would see where the lines are converging towards the horizon, we are interrupted by the idea of the bad guy. Okay, so the angle being low has accentuated the converging lines, especially near the top of the frame, to be really steep and really uh, dramatic in their acceleration towards the horizon, right? And they're all kind of sort of leading us right here. Bang, we can't miss him. 
if we're following the pattern subconsciously and the and the human mind it turns out biologically speaking um, has been programmed to look for pattern in nature right pattern in nature represents uh, for us somehow um, safety or a food source or whatever it, it meant to our ancient ancestors those instinctive subconscious responses to pattern and repetition and profile um, resonate within us within our biological selves and so when we when we use them in our cinematography to conjure and elicit an emotion from our audience it's that it's that baser resonance that we're tapping into right and we can get the audience to feel really sort of moved or excited or you know scared of this image of the joker returning to uh, you know extract revenge on batman for you know being a jerk and here it is right and it's so it's like it's coming towards the finale of the movie and we're already getting ratcheted up emotionally by all the action and the dialogue and, and stuff. And then we have a very rhetorical moment like this, um, which states non-verbally the importance of this character and the weight that he has compositionally within the entire story structure. Depth of field can be used very uh, expertly to create focal points specifically um, to the exclusion of other details in the frame. So where leading lines and a horizon convergence rely on detail that is, um, you know, present from foreground, middle ground to background, uh, depth of field works in the exact opposite. So this is using all the detail within the frame to create an overall message in the image that tells our, our eyes and our brain to do something. In this case, depth of field is saying, don't worry about all this detail back there. It's not important to the major point that I'm making, which is, woo, chocolate, right? Hershey's Kisses, especially around the holiday time, right? And even though we see, compositionally, we see that these things in the background that are out of focus are more Hershey's Kisses, if they were in sharp detail, uh, then the difference between foreground and background will be less dramatic and the emphasis would be um, on is there a message in the pattern and there's not the only message here is mm, chocolate right and so that can be represented by one Hershey's kiss one perfectly placed in the center of the frame Hershey's kiss ready for you to devour right? And you can already almost taste it. You don't need to see any other detail in that frame because the only point here is, wouldn't you just love to pop this in your mouth right now? You know it's good. I know it's good. Why don't you go out and buy a bag of Hershey's Kisses, right? And that's advertising. But we use it in a lot of circumstances. So here's, um, this is uh, uh, Hurlbut. What's his name? Um, Shane Hurlbut, uh, Sons and Daughters is the movie. And the troubled teen is, you know, on the road thinking about how her life sucks. And she's in a contemplative moment and she's in a bar with, you know, a bunch of, you know, ruffians and whatnot. The background is out of focus, but we know where she is and we know that there's still people and threats around that she needs to worry about. What we really, all the director wants us to focus on is her level of anxiety, right? And all we need to see is her physical performance to understand that she's operating right now under a high level of anxiety. And what exactly is happening back here is not necessary for the point that's being made here. Does that make sense? Okay, so we don't need to see this in detail. And if we do put detail back here, this is where John de Borman and, and my opinion sometimes will go our separate ways. 
you know, he's the kind of person who likes a big frame where the audience's eyes can wander and pick what they want to look at. And that's okay sometimes. But most of the time, I think, it's our responsibility as a cinematographer to direct the audience's eyes to what the author wants us to see, because that's where the story is. There's no story about this guy back here playing pool. We'd have to go back there and figure it out and interview the guy and talk to him and say, hey, what's up? What's your deal? And then we get sidetracked. We're on a tangent that has nothing to do with our story. So we leave this delicately out of focus because it's not that important. It's important to know where she is when she comes to the conclusion that, oh, maybe I shouldn't have you know, run away or whatever. Uh, but we don't need to see, for instance, what it says on the lamp over the pool table. It's just a beer ad anyway. Who cares? Who cares who this is playing pool back there? Um, you know, these little pools of light on the wall, what do they reveal? Who knows? Who cares? It's not about the movie is not about the pool hall. The movie is about this girl and how she's going to fix her situation. Right. This is why you need to know how to control your exposure values so you can do this purposefully. Now, in a room that's really, really dark with a camera that has a, you know, a moderately sensitive ISO setting, you might go to a very open f-stop inherently because the camera is trying to see as much light as it can to create a balanced uh, exposure. But if not, if, the, if there's a lot of light on the girl and this look has been created in post by putting in, you know, by crushing the values in, in DaVinci Resolve and putting extra shadow contrast into the image, which is entirely possible. Uh, if this look was created more in post-production, then all of the lights in this room would be significantly brighter than the way they are represented in this frame. Okay, that's what the value of post-production offers us in terms of digital cinematography. We can take an image that is relatively flat in contrast um, and relatively underemphasizing any kind of a tone, and we can we can adjust a lot of factors in the image: the color saturation, the color balance, um, the contrast. Uh, we can decide whether or not we want to blow highlights or preserve them, whether we want to block up, they call it, uh, the shadows by inking it up so we don't see any detail, or do we want to open up the shadows and reveal more detail by lowering the contrast in areas of the frame. We can do a lot of stuff in post-production to an image that has been very broadly interpreted with very flat, neutral contrast and tone, right? We call it shooting in raw format. Okay, and then they go in and they make this look in post production later. But if this look was created in camera, we're following a very different set of rules and and you know depth of field can be simulated digitally in post if we have backgrounds that are more detailed than we meant them to be when we shot initially. Um, but anytime you save on set by shooting something very neutral without a, without using visual expression. Whatever time you've saved there, you're going to spend that time in post-production and probably twice as much time in post-production at a minimum to reintroduce the vibe that you were that you were thinking about on set on the day that you committed those images to media. So a lot of times it's a lot better to just go ahead and shoot the what your mind's eye sees and make it look as close as you can on the monitor on set on the day as you think is appropriate and then just put finishing touches on these images in post. If you have, if you have to completely build a concept in post-production, it is very, very expensive. Okay, so part and parcel with uh, uh, depth of field was the bokeh concept okay and this is where a lot of folks sort of parted ways uh, intellectually uh, on the homework assignment uh, i got some things that people call bokeh that are absolutely not bokeh okay simply because a background is out of focus does not imply uh, that there's bokeh present okay bokeh is a direct relationship between 
the circle of confusion where the the lens in in concert with the capture device uh, are experiencing point sources that it can't fully resolve into a small point of light. It's blooming and blossoming out into a large uh, exaggerated uh, out of focus blob. Um, it, it's for point sources in the background of our images uh, or in the extreme foreground of our images where there's a middle ground that is sharp and that is occupying the point of emphasis and so either the foreground or the background is out of focus and point sources in either of those regions are doing this right here, this bokeh ball uh, phenomenon that we see in the frame here, where it's basically the reaction of a point source and its degree of out of focusness with the actual aperture of the lens itself and typically this happens at the most widest aperture so if the lens is open all the way in its f-stop and you have a point source in the background that is demonstrably demonstratively out of focus when it renders in the image it's going to bear the resemblance of the fully open aperture inside the lens um, and and then it'll share some color from the source itself um, and it will be it will be out of focus with with a similar um, with a similar um, consistency of de of common details in the background, like what we see here, right? There's really no bokeh present here. This is not bokeh. This is a reflection of this lamp in a picture hanging on the wall. This is an actual soft light source, a sconce on the wall but it's not a point source, it's a diffuse source. And a diffuse source doesn't usually offer us this bokeh opportunity. It would be something like a hard street light far in the distance, okay? And to drive that point home, here's a quick bokeh test that I did in downtown Orlando at the fountain in uh, Thornton Park. And I'm just going in from minimum focus at where the water's sort of dripping in the foreground to some cars pulling up to the fountain in the roundabout uh, and I let them be out of focus, come into focus, and then let them go back out of focus. And you can see the lens, and you can see how the lens is reacting as it goes from minimum to maximum focus. Uh, and you can see the bokeh emerge and recede and re and, and reemerge. Watch this. Resolving the image through the foreground out of focus brought the cars in focus and then shifting back to the foreground and then beyond the foreground to minimum focus. Look at how those bokeh balls just stretched out of shape and became giant, fluffy, soft little balls of joy. So this was an anamorphic lens that I was testing. Um, just to see how, you know, the ovular bokeh would look and to, to see the flares and to see how everything was going to distort as it went out of focus. It wasn't about the image and what it looked like in true detail. I wanted to see how this would happen with that particular lens when it was wide open on the f-stop shooting at night, how it would render highlights. So what have we been talking about? We are talking about composition and framing. What is composition? Simply put, composition refers to the arrangement of objects in a frame. And these are objects with significant value or contribution to your story, okay? Not the arrangement of random objects, the arrangement of objects that have to do with the moment, the dialogue, the narrative, it, they're important to the scene, right? Uh, this the, the screen is referred to as the frame. So I'm talking about the frame and I'm what I'm referring to. And I think of the frame as I uh, see, I go back to the film days where, you know, I could go up to the camera and I could look through a viewfinder and the viewing system would show me exactly what the point of view was through the lens, right? And we, we don't get that anymore. What we get is a sort of third party 
point of view of what the lens is seeing as interpreted by the capture device. It's not the same thing. So when I talk about the frame, I'm thinking about what I see in the viewfinder and what those limitations are based on what format the, the film camera shoots, okay? Uh, but you can also think of the frame as what the audience will see in whatever your exhibition screen is. So if it's a theater screen, there's gonna be a specific aspect ratio going on. Uh, if it's a TV screen, there's gonna be a different aspect ratio going on. If it's a window on a website, it may be yet another exhibition frame that you're using different from the previous two okay so when i'm talking about the frame think about the exp the exposition or the exhibition frame or the actual view through the lens okay tools for composition include the type of the shot that you're going to use the angle of the shot the arrangement of the objects within the shot and then all of the compositional rules that we've just been speaking about Another one of those rules uh, from the original list was uh, the rule of thirds. This is, this is a directive on how to organize the, the elements within a frame so that they can demonstrate some kind of hierarchy from one to another, okay? So the rule of thirds is just an idea. And the idea is you take your cinematic frame, whatever that rectangle is, and you divide it up into nine equivalent zones. Okay, and they go from upper left to lower right in order, right? And what's created are four, what we would call foci, focus points, right? These are points of intersection between horizontal compositional lines and vertical compositional lines. Okay, and these four points of intersection are at key points within the cinematic frame. And when you place elements on these converging lines, it's kind of like the ley lines that they draw over the globe that attract UFOs, right? It's kind of the similar thing. It's the frame being divided up into converging uh, um, transition lines, right? And where they cross is subconsciously an important place for our eyes. Our eyes seem to go there automatically, okay? For instance, here's a scene from 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? The four points of focus are incorporating things in the foreground and in the background. The very center box is considered a very important position for any element that is exactly in the center of the frame. That item is either the highest order in the hierarchy, or it is the most balanced personality in terms of a character, um, it, or it is, or conversely, it is a character or an event that will offer a pivot point where the story could go one way or the other way. And we don't know yet which way it's gonna fall because that person or that event is happening right down the middle of the frame. In this case, we have 2001 A Space Odyssey. We got a horizontal compositional plan here that is drawing a line uh, at the necktie knot of Dave and Frank Poole, all right, which is positioning their eyes almost at the upper left and upper right point of convergence. And these are the left and right one third lines, which are a place where our eyes immediately go looking for detail. It's a psychological thing. Here's Hal, he's slightly out of focus, but he's in the exact middle of the frame. Because he's out of focus, our eyes don't go there first. Although our eyes have a tendency to do one of two things, go to the exact middle of a, com uh, of a composition and work to the outside, or if there is a point along anywhere along the perimeter of an image that is more colorful, brighter, or in greater detail than anything else in the frame, our eye will go there first. And then our eye will search concentrically towards the center of the frame for other information and detail. It's just a psychological thing that our brains do, okay? So that makes this 
frame very successful because what we see are objects in the foreground that are sharper than objects in the background. They are hovering on the left and right one third lines. So we're getting the information immediately subconsciously to our brain. Frank and Dave had to go inside the pod to talk. So Hal in the background, who we see as a secondary uh, point of interest, can't hear the conversation. And this is at a point where the two of these astronauts are going, yeah, dude, the computer that's driving the ship is nuts and we got to shut him down. Right. It's a very important part, part in the movie. And this frame is sort of helping us to hear that and see that and understand that moment very clearly. Here's a shot from Titanic. In this shot, it's um, it's it's the part of the story where um, Cal is is accusing Jack of stealing the heart of the ocean that he gave to Rose as an engagement gift. The heart of the ocean is dangling from uh, from the security guard's hand, right dead center in the frame, dead center in the frame, meaning this is the focal point of all the action that's happening around it. It's a very valuable thing. Cal has it insured for like a million dollars. He gave it to her as a wedding gift. They think he stole it. This is the security guard, David Werner, who's ready to take uh, Leo out to the railing and throw him overboard. Uh, and this is the security guard who found the heart of the ocean in the jacket that Leo was wearing when he was out walking around on the, on the ocean deck, right? All of this compositional, and then look at where the characters are oriented within the frame. Leo is at the left upper one third converging line. Rose and Cal are together at the upper right converging line. Cal is right on it and Rose is off to one side of the right vertical one third line. The, the heart of the ocean is right in the middle. There's nothing really on the lower horizontal compositional axis. Uh, it's all happening on the vertical axis more or less, except look at the top one third horizontal line. Everybody's head is there except the security guard, he's slightly above it. And he's also the furthest out of frame. So in terms of proximity to the diamond, he has the least gravity or the least influence in this scene. Everybody else who means something to the scene is closer in, and then the object itself is in the very center. This is not an accident. This wasn't random. This was designed to be shot this way. Okay, this is Russell Carpenter, by the way. Here's a shot from uh, Mad Max, Fury Road. And look at where we put Tom Hardy. Is it Tom Hardy? Yeah. He's in the upper one third transaction line, transition line right here. Boom, look at that. And he's being held prisoner but he snatched a gun. And so he's standing on the, on the right one third line, his face with that steel mask indicating his, in, his uh, incarceration is on the upper crisscross line. And then the gun he stole is on the upper left crisscross, right? It's almost like a big L. Boom, there it is. So good framing uh, and the rule of threes, as long as your main points of focus are on these places of convergence um, being the most important parts of these intersecting lines, you're going to demonstrate uh, good compositional uh, thinking, application of compositional um, premise. Um, and you're gonna avoid what we would consider bad framing, which is pretty much anything else, right? So. Um, I've got somewhere in here a graphic of what we consider bad framing. But before I show you that, I want to show you one more compositional plan that you might follow, actually two more. Uh, one is the golden ratio. So remember I said the brain can think two ways. It can either go to the center of an image and radiate outwards looking for important detail. Um, or if there's nothing in the center that is sharp and in focus, but there's something towards the edges of the image that is offering some kind of interest or detail that we can 
latch onto and then follow that detail through the remainder of the frame looking for other relevant details, you end up with the golden ratio, which is if you could plot it mathematically, it just turns out that it's the same kind of arc that you'd see in a Nautilus shell, which was reminiscent of this staircase in the very beginning. Um, but it also can be represented mathematically by what we call the Fibonacci uh, sequence of numbers, okay? Which is basically a simple formula, really. Um, and if you follow the, the, the curve of the golden uh, ratio, uh, you'll find that uh, in, the, in, the, in the very center of this compositional element, you see there's two stops along the way, one, one, and then two, then three, then five, right? One plus one is two. One plus two is three. Two plus three is five. Five plus three is eight. Eight plus five is 13. That's the mathematical relationship of all of these specific points plotted on the golden ratio graph, right? The previous two added together equals the, re the remainder. 34 is 13 plus 21. 21 plus 34 is 55, right? And it leads you around as points on a graph like this, all the way around to the edge of your frame. And you can apply that to a lot of different compositions. Here is a shot that we talked about last, last week or week before. The girl with the, the, the pearl earring, right? Her eye is at the very center of the Fibonacci golden ratio. And as we go around in the concentric sort of spin, we see the eyebrow, the line of transition on the cheek from highlight to shadow, the nose, the opposite cheekbone and eye, the headpiece, the scarf, and it keeps going all the way down the hair and leads us to the far corner of the frame in a horizontal composition. In a vertical composition, the center of the sequence is here at the headdress and it goes around and follows the jawline to the pearl earring itself. Can you see that happening? You can also apply it to a composition like this. Here's two old pensioners sitting on a, a, a wrought iron bench on the sidewalk outside of this villa. Looks like it's in Italy, right? If you start from the woman on the bench and you follow the sequence, you go around to her buddy, up on the edge of frame to the house and down the stairs to the far corner of the frame. You could apply the same principle to a frame in a uh, full metal jacket. So here's Vincent Donofrio and um, Matthew Mc um, not Matthew McConaughey, uh, Matthew Modine, right? Uh, in this scene, Matthew Modine is pissed off at Private Pile because Private Pile has been screwing up since he signed up and he showed up to Paris Island to join the Marine Corps. He's not cut out for this and he keeps screwing up and he doesn't seem to be able to learn effectively what he needs to learn to become a successful soldier. Matthew Modine has been uh, charged with training Private Pile and he is not happy about it. He's not happy because he's also afraid for his own life. When these guys graduate from Paris Island, they're gonna be shipped over to Vietnam and they're gonna fight in a war in Indochina that is very bloody and most likely he will return dead, right? Uh, so the composition starts right here, right at Matthew Modine's pituitary, where his emotion is going, damn it, why am I the one who's stuck with seeing this mit misfit through boot camp? And we follow the composition around to his eyes and the fact that he's looking forward in attention and not looking at Private Pile. And we keep going around the hat. Which shoulder is his gun on? Because Private Pile didn't know his left from his right. And so his drill instructor beat him on the face and asked him, what side did I just slap you on? What side did I just slap you on? Very, very famous scene from the beginning of Full Metal Jacket. 
here's the gun. Here it is on his shoulder. Here is his eyes. He's at attention, staring forward. The composition leads us around to the proper soldier and leads us right in towards the direction of the idiot and out of frame, right? And this is Fibonacci at work in this frame. You could also argue that Matthew Modine is on the left one third line of the rule of thirds and Private Pyle is on the right uh, vertical line of composition. You could also order that, or you could also assert that the horizon is placed exactly in the middle of this frame and runs left to right through the exact center of horizontal composition. Okay, so you could almost argue that both compositional principles are at work here. But this has been noted, so this is something that we know was consciously done. Can you see the compositional theory applied to this frame? If you start with a Fibonacci, where do you suppose the center of the, the focal point is? The guy standing up. The guy standing up. And there's, uh, there's another way of, of arriving at that conclusion, right? What what might that be? I haven't really spoken about it very much. I just mentioned it, but I haven't shown you any physical demonstrations. Hierarchy is generally arranged from top to bottom, and therefore the elements within the frame that represent the highest position within the frame are considered more important than objects that are, that are at the bottom of the frame, unless the top of the frame has been rendered out of focus in lieu of the bottom of the frame, which is then relegated to a detail sharp foreground. Then foreground is more important than background. An out of focus object in the top of the frame would indicate something in the in the background and a and an in focus object towards the bottom of the frame would represent something in the foreground. In this case, it's all sharp. So we revert back to the highest element in the frame having the hierarchy, and that would be Adam Baldwin's character of Mother. Okay, in the movie, Full Metal Jacket, Mother is a very violent white supremacist, Southern redneck who is in Vietnam and has learned to accept his brothers, black, white, or otherwise, because they, are, they all wear green at the end of the day and they're all fighting a common enemy. And so, rather than turning his wrath on his typical sources of anxiety, namely one of the black guys in the unit, uh, he is directing that anger towards the North Vietnamese because they have shot the black guy who is mother's uh, platoon partner. And now mother is getting enraged and mother's gonna run out there with his machine gun and rescue this guy. The focal point is right here mother's expression of his violent passion, his bullets, and he's going to spray this, he's going to hose down the whole area with 50 caliber machine gun fire and try to get his buddy out of a, a sniper trap, right? So we're starting right here where his bullets crisscross on his chest, and we're going to go around and find his angry face. We're going to go right down to his powerful arms and his BDUs to his machine gun, we're gonna see the photographer and cowboy right behind him because they're scared and they don't know what to do. And it's gonna keep going around and lead us right out of the frame over here, right? It's just taking us around more detail, more detail, more detail, more detail, more detail. And when we get here, we can move, we can cut and move to the next shot. Does that make any sense? In this scene, all of these guys are sitting there watching the black guy get shot up. They said, go check it out. We'll wait here behind this pile of rubble. The black guy goes out to check out what's going on and the sniper shoots him, but he doesn't kill him. He wounds him. And the idea is if he's wounded and in pain, he calls out to his buddies. His buddies come out to retrieve him. And then the, shoot, the, the sniper kills everybody who comes to rescue the first guy. That's the trap. And these guys down here know it because they've seen it before and they're afraid to do anything about it. And mother is PO'd because, and I think he even sees it in the movie. He says, nobody can pick on my, my guy, but me. And I gotta go get him because he's, he's gonna be killed. 
And so it's a very pivotal scene on mother's part where he finally can takes control of his, his anger and his resentment and his internal struggle. And he, he, a, a switch gets flipped in mother's head. And so it's important in this shot to get all of that right. And as soon as we get the point, boosh, we're out of it. We get it, we get it, we get it, we're out of it. Next shot. You can think about composition in another way. You can think about it in what we call a quadrant rule, uh, which is what they used uh, allegedly in the film Drive. The DP was uh, Newton Thomas Siegel, I believe. And so in this shot, if you superimpose the quadrant um, compositional uh, theory over this frame, you'll see that the two lines converge, one horizontal, one vertical, exactly in the center of the frame is where they intersect. And in the upper left quadrant, facing out of the frame left, from the upper left is uh, Ryan Gosling, right? Now, there's a couple of things you can think about with a frame like this. The first is, this is what we call short framing. So Ryan Gosling is in the left of frame looking off camera left. It's a very short distance out of the frame. And so he is looking at something that is clearly outside of our purview. We don't see what he's looking at just yet. We will in the next in the next successive shot, but we don't know at this moment what he's looking at. It's outside of our omnipotent point of view. This can be considered a negative framing because we don't know what's out here. Only he does, and he's not saying anything yet. It could be argued that positive framing or affirmative framing would be if Ryan Gosling were positioned on the right side of frame, looking through the existing frame and then off frame left, because then there's a, there's a chance that the thing that he's looking at is residing somewhere over here and we can see it. But in this case, we don't. And so this is very provocative framing because traditionally speaking, Ryan would be positioned over here on the top and bottom right quadrants, not the top, top and bottom left. So this is supposedly um, designed to elicit anxiety from us. In other words, he sees something he's not sure about outside of the frame. We don't know what it is yet, but we already feel anxious because compositionally, he's not where we expected him to be. We expected him to be over here and he's over here. Do you see how that just that simple visual could start inciting anxiety in your audience before anything is even done to justify it? And we did it very simply by where we decided to put Ryan in the frame. Can you see that happening? Yeah, they do a similar technique in Mr. Robot. Yes, and I'm going to show you that in a couple of seconds, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I saw the first episode of Mr. Robot and I said, oh, no, this is all wrong and I hate it. By the end of the episode, I was like, I love this. I want more because I got it. I, it, it, I, I got it in my head. I was like, wait a minute. This is like not this was not an accident. It's happening a lot. Like every other every couple of shots, we're getting these violations of traditional compositional wisdom that we've been applying for years to our images and these guys are just throwing it all out the window but they're not really throwing it away what they're doing is is they're turning it on its head so that the audience never feels complacent never feels comfortable like oh i know what's going to happen next oh no you don't and i'm going to prove it to you Right. First, I'm going to turn all of the visuals on their head and you're not going to know what's going on because everything that you learned about good composition is going to be the opposite. And therefore, everything you think is going to happen is probably going to be the opposite as well. Right. This is what's at work in Mr. Robot. So let's talk about it. Composition and framing. We got types of shots. Now, in your last assignment, I asked you to just show me your notions of a wide shot, a medium shot, and a close-up. Very few people got the medium shot right. And I don't blame you because I didn't talk a lot about it. Uh, and that was by design. I want to see what you think about these framing solutions before I teach you the right way to do it. Okay. And see what you instinctively know and what you have to be sort of guided through. 
everybody got the wide shot. That's fairly, fairly easy. Although some folks were a little bit too generous in their assessment of what needed to be in the final frame. Um, Close-ups was a mixed bag, but mostly people got it. And mostly uh, you selected close-ups that were um, technically close-ups, yes, but they were more aggressive close-ups than what we consider a standard close-up in Hollywood. A standard close-up in Hollywood, if you're wearing a button-down shirt, the bottom of the frame, you see my, you see my thumbnail on my computer, right? If I position myself like this, the bottom of the frame is right at my second button and my head is one or two fingers below the top of the frame. You see that? This is a traditional Hollywood close-up. And it usually happens on a 50 millimeter lens at about six or eight feet away or a 35 millimeter lens four to six feet away. Okay, this is a standard close-up. This is what we call a necktie close-up. If I was wearing a tie, the knot would be right here, right sitting on the bottom frame line. And then the top frame line would probably be giving me what we call a haircut right here, cutting the top of my head off. This is a necktie close-up, all right? This frame down here is a necktie close-up. They're calling it a standard close-up and they're being a little bit too liberal with their, um, with their assigning of labels for these images. All right, this is inside of a standard close-up. A big close-up is usually when the chin is sitting on the bottom of the frame and I've got a and I've got a haircut. We also call this, if it's from a higher point of view, a choker, because the frame, the bottom of the frame is choking me right at the Adam's apple. And the top of the frame is giving me a quote unquote haircut. And then of course, an ECU is right in here on the eyes. Okay. That's an extreme close-up. So a lot of you for close-up gave me anything from a choker to an extreme close-up. So I wanna help you relax your notions of a close-up and reserve the extreme close-up and the big close-up for dramatic moments where that proximity, where you're really up in the grill of somebody who's about to say something super important, that moment is very, special, distinctive. And then an ordinary close-up where we just wanna hear their critical dialogue with a good view of their performance, we're out here, we're a little bit looser, okay? So here's some examples of bad framing. Why would you say that this frame right here is bad framing? Anybody wanna take a stab at it? He has too much headroom. Too much headroom. Thank you very much. And that is using the industry lingo. Kudos to you. Yeah. Where's his head? Like the middle third of the frame. Sitting right on the horizon. What's more important? The concept of something that may happen in the future or the character themselves? The character arguably is more important, right? Now, which way is the character looking? Towards the camera. Is he looking straight at the camera? Maybe. Maybe. What's throwing you off? His hair. I can't really see his eyes. I'm thinking it's his posture. His posture kind of look, looks like maybe he's throwing his look off of his right shoulder, which would indicate a right to left look, not a look straight down the barrel or right into the lens, we call it. We call it straight down the barrel, right? He's not really looking straight down the barrel. It looks like he's throwing his look off his right shoulder, which then instinctively would indicate that he needs to be placed where? In the left of frame or the right of frame? Right of frame to look across the screen. Right of frame. And where are we going to put his head? On the upper right third. I think so. We're going to move him to the right and we're going to move him up into that right upper one third quadrant or well, not really. Well, yeah, it's a quadrant, but in the rule of thirds, it will be the upper right ninth. Right. Precinct. <laughs> 
Good. That's that's a good analysis, right? Don't put him in the middle, right? He's clearly not a balanced character, right? If you wanted to just speak in terms of legend, you know, there's presumably very few perfectly balanced individuals, right? Um, if you think of all the characters you've ever seen represented in literature, film, legend, right? You could probably think of one or two characters only that would be most appropriately occupying the very center of the frame, right? And they tend to be very significant characters with very heavy um, rhetorical value, right? So arguably you could say that's why many of the compositions in classical art that were composed during the Renaissance where the only real themes they had to work with were religion that Jesus was always in the center of the frame because he was supposedly the only perfectly balanced individual. And so he would be in the very center of the frame and then everybody else would populate the edges of frame left and right. We saw that in the uh, Matthias Stomer uh, um, teasing of Christ, right? With the candle, Can, uh, Christ was the only figure in the center of the frame, right? Even though they were picking on him. How about this shot? What do you think's theoretically wrong with this shot? It's kind of boring. There's like not really anything going on. There's not anything going on because we don't see much, right? It's a narrow angle. But being a narrow angle in itself doesn't necessarily make it wrong. But what do you think might make it more aesthetically pleasing? Do you know what kinetic energy and potential energy are? What What is kinetic energy? It's energy that's actively being um, used, I guess. Used, demonstrated, right? It is positive, it's, it's happening, right? What's potential energy? Energy that is stagnant, it's not being used yet, it's waiting to be enacted. It's stored and ready to be unleashed, right? So the water behind a dam is considered potential energy. Water in a rushing river is considered kinetic energy. A subject in the center of the frame has no energy. They're in the middle, right? They can move and we might not be able to tell if they move directly at the lens. But if they're in one side of the frame or the other, they have now an imbalance in their energy state. Energy is flowing from one side of the frame to the other. It's flowing from the side of the frame they occupy towards the side of the frame that they don't occupy. And the movement is implied in that direction. But if they're in the center, you can't move them anywhere because you don't know where they're going. And then the insinuation is neither do they, right? This character is looking right to left. If you move her to the right, she is now out of balance, therefore kinetic, looking into the frame, through the frame and out to the other side. She has somewhere to go. And it's a very hopeful idea because if you're moving forward, you're advancing. You're learning, you're growing, you're gaining. If you're not moving, you're stagnant, right? What about this frame? It's too little headroom. <laughs> Give her a haircut for no good reason. She's on the left one third. She's looking left to right. She's got a correct look line going on. We just gave her a haircut for some reason. I don't understand. And it's a little uncomfortable. Arguably, I think this is the least offensive of the three because this is what I would consider a minor violation in lieu of this and this. The only time we wanna put somebody right here 
is when the author is saying she has a very difficult choice to make. If she was looking straight down the barrel, you could say the author's trying to tell us that she's got a decision to make and she doesn't know which way to go. But she's not. She's looking off to frame left. So we should put her in frame right if we want to be traditional and in frame left if we're being millennial, if we're being new new wave, if we're being Mr. Robot, we put her in the left of frame looking left because that's more provocative than being in the right of frame, right? And then this is just junk. <laughs> this is just junk. And I see this a lot. Um, and I think that those students should be flogged. Just kidding. Okay. Types of angles, types of camera angles. So there's framing, composition within that framing, and then there are angles where the camera is looking, right? Is it looking from high up? Is it looking from low down upward? Is it from high up looking downward, right? Is it at a weird angle, a skew to the action? Is it on a canted or Dutch angle, right? What is it? All right, there's a neat video ultimate guide to camera angles. I have put it in web courses for you. And rather than burn the class time here, I think if you just go check it out on your own time, I think it's about 15 minutes long. So it'll be something that, you know, grab a soda or something, relax on the couch, give it a look. And it's going to talk about these types of things, angles and framing choices that you can make. And it'll give you some really interesting examples. Okay. I think it's really the only significant video I've given you to watch this week. So it's a pretty light week. What I want to do now with the time that we have left is I want to talk to you. I want to ask you what you see from a series of examples. And I have plucked them right out of Mr. Robot. And I've got about, I don't know, 10 or 11 of them here. And I want to see if you can tell me what organizational principles, what compositional rules are being followed in each of these examples. And, and I want you to analyze the image and, and tell me what you see. Interpret the image and tell me the feeling or the tone, the compositional um, elements uh, and, and how they work. Okay. And don't worry about giving me the right or the wrong answer because it's not always clear what the right answer is. And even when you think you know the right answer, like anything else in filmmaking, the rules can be rewritten to suit your own rhetorical purpose, right? So even though we say, oh, red means passion or red means anger, right? In your movie, if you decide to reassign red to a different emotion or a different feedback loop for the audience, that's your business as an author. It's your right as a filmmaker to exercise your creative license, okay? But it is important for you to know the difference so that you know the responsibility you have and the ramifications that you risk of trying to re-signify red as something other than what the audience expects to see or know. Does that make sense? If the audience expects to accept red as love, and you have a movie where the people are fighting all the time and they're, and red is everywhere as a compositional plan, it's going to be very confusing to the audience until you re-signify the meaning of red for your audience. And as soon as you do it in a way that they understand and they can correlate and they can say, oh, I get it. In this movie, red means battle. They're battling with one another and they're never going to be happy. And it's, it's like a... Um, it's like an ironic statement. It, red doesn't mean love in this movie. It means hate, right? As soon as the audience goes, oh, that's what he's saying. Every time they see red, they're going to get the, oh yeah, here they go. They're going to start, look at this. Woof, there goes the plate against the wall. Wang, there goes the coffee pot, right? And they'll become engaged in your movie because now they know they've cracked the code. And it's very important for you to help them crack the code if you're going to re-signify what traditional tropes mean, Okay. Okay, so you can be counterintuitive to what the standard narratives are. But let's just talk about this exercise in terms of the standard narratives first before we break the rules. Agreed? Okay, 
So here we go. First shot, what do you see? First, I want to ask you, <laughs> how many of you here have not seen Mr. Robot? Oh, no. At all? Do you have any idea what Mr. Robot is about? Estefania hasn't seen it either, apparently. I haven't either. How many of you are not likely to ever watch Mr. Robot? Because there's spoilers in here, folks. That's what I'm getting at. I don't care. Okay. Good. Anybody else care about the spoilers? Actually, this video is going to go on YouTube, so I'm going to spoil it for everybody ultimately, but what can I do? This is the lesson plan. I got to move forward. It's all I got. All right. What do you see here in this frame? There's a few things going on, actually. Like composition-wise? Like Yep, compositionally, shot design, everything we've been talking about today. What do you see going on here? Uh, I think it's following the rule of thirds. And he's in the top right and the middle right. And he's looking off to the right, which is kind of weird. And then she's in the very center. And she's looking to the left of the shot off in the right direction. OK. And we're both in focus. And it's like a shallow depth of field. Okay. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? What What else do we see? Anybody want to take a step? I mean, anything. Pick the low hanging fruit. Well, actually, the rule of thirds was the low hanging fruit. That's already been, that's already been cited. What else? We, I mean, pick hierarchy, proximity, pattern, line, texture, convergence. What? Anything? What do you see going on? Is there any convergence going on here? I don't think there is because I don't really see a a specific horizon line here. To me, the horizon is somewhere off frame left. So, but what I do see, if you can bear with me, is I see repetition of a diagonal composition happening here in the background. All these lines, the lights in the on the the platform outside the train, the, the frame of the window, the frame of the railing, the frame on this window, the frame on the railing up top and the frame on the light bar up, up in the cove of the car itself. I see a lot of diagonal lines repeating in a pattern in the background. Do we see that? And it's slightly out of focus. So it's, we're not being, our attention is not being drawn to it as an important detail. It's merely a something in there to texturize the frame, if you will. He's on the right one third, but she's in the middle. A character in the middle, in the middle is supposed to be centered, right? Um, she has a choice to make. She's not a well-balanced individual. She is erratic. She's emotional. She's conflicted. This is her brother and her brother wants to blow stuff up and he's a computer hacker. He wants to bring down the World Economic Forum and she's trying to figure out if she really wants to help him do that or not because it could mean jail time or death. He is also crazy and she is not. She is a balanced mind and he is a schizophrenic textbook. He's looking off frame right because he has an agenda that goes leads him this way. Short framing is positive or negative? Negative. He's up to no good and he's looking that way. She's conflicted and looking for the way out. She's looking the other way. She's looking for the way out of the frame. Is, do you see it now? This is not an accident. They could be both looking in the same direction. They could be looking at each other. They're not. This is a directorial choice. Don't look at your sister. You're nuts. You might not even be her brother in your own mind right now. You're the other guy. And the other guy wants to blow shit up. 
And she's like, I don't know if you're the other guy or you're my brother right now. I don't know if I should help you, if it will help you get better if I help you take down the grid and, and destroy the, the American financial system, or if I should just run away and call the cops and, and get you help. I don't know what I should do. Do you see that in the composition now? Okay, that's what that's what I'm trying to do with you right now. This is this is analysis and deconstruction of the image. Okay. What about this one? They have lines on the top and on the counter. What are they doing? Uh, they're horizontal, and then the lines are horizontal, but they're leading straight down into the center where the girl is sitting with the laptop. They're not all horizontal, but they are converging towards the horizon and her head is sitting right on it. Do yeah, you I don't know it's on. In these yeah. vertical details right here, do you see a horizon? This is a little above the horizon, but the horizon extends right along this vertical countertop and goes right through her face and right underneath that picture frame. There's your horizon and she's point, she's setting right on it. And these lines are all converging towards her head. Right. And these patterns are receding towards the horizon as well. This is, this is repetition and pattern. This is convergence. This is horizon. This is horizontal compositional framing. All three heads are on the horizontal compositional line in on the horizon. They are all equal in hierarchy to one another. This is the sister. This is after this. He is the leader of the band. She decides to help him. She's organizing the rest of the group and giving them the, the plan. They're all equal. Does that make sense? Do you see how that can be interpreted that way? How about this one? What do you see? There's bokeh in the back. We got some bokeh going on. Happy little bokeh balls. What else do you see? It's an extreme close up. It's an E. Well, is it an ECU? Is it just eyes or is it a choker? Um, well, it's a it's a haircut and then uh, uh, maybe a little bit over the choker. I thought the choker was like just cutting off from the towards the chin, and it's kind of a little bit more. The chin sitting on the bottom frame line and it's going right through his Adam's apple. This is a choker close up. Big close up would be inside the nostrils, just eyes. Or I'm sorry, ECU would be just eyes. Right? Right in there. Right in here is your ECU. This is a choker. Literally, it's a choker. In this scene, he's choking. He doesn't know if he has the courage to move forward with his own plan and it was his idea. So his close-up is a choker because he's choking on his own resolve. We got bokeh balls in the background, which are out of focus. And then we got this guy here. What can you say about this guy? He's looking to, um, I don't know his character's name, Rami Malek. And maybe he's like looking to him to make a decision. Where's he looking? To his eyes, I guess. Where's he like looking? Like across frame to him. Where's he looking? Oh, short frame again. So he's also dark side. Dark side, it's bad, right? He's thinking of doing something bad, but he's choking on the decision. He can't make it. So his alter ego appears to coax him into making a choice also can i make a comment on the lighting because he's half lit he's half lit he's conflicted he's conflicted exactly should i do it should i not do it he's choking in the moment he doesn't know what to do he's conflicted this guy is also half lit is he good or is he bad i don't know he only shows up as this guy's alter ego when he's thinking about doing bad stuff so he's probably not a good guy. He is this guy's alter ego. This is, what's his name in the show? It's, um, uh, is it in my things here? Um, 
I forget the character's name in the show. This is Mr. Robot. This character right here, which is this guy's antithesis, his alter ego, his Brad Pitt to his Edward Norton, right? His name's Elliot. Elliot, thank you. This guy only appeared, manifests to Elliot when Elliot is thinking about doing the bad stuff. When Elliot is stable and in a good mood, Mr. Robot is never seen. He's never comes around. Okay. Which is also why Mr. Robot is not sharp. You would think this close in the frame to Elliot that he would have detail as well, but he doesn't. Why doesn't he not have detail? Because he isn't real. Because he's not real. Ding, 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 ding. Very good. He's not real. Therefore, he's not in sharp focus. Elliot is real. Elliot is in focus. Okay. What do you see going on here? You're probably not going to know this unless you're a fan of the show. Well, well, should I should I just describe the context? Do it, baby. Okay, so this is Elliot's father, um, and this is like moments before he keels over and dies of a heart attack. Um, and in this moment, he's conflicted because his son like isn't really showing him love or appreciation and in this moment in the show we don't know why but we find out later love i love you why don't you love me why don't you love me back and he is sort of corrupted with the reflection of the red architecture right here it's half lit only half of his face is red only half of his face is symbolizing the expression of love the other half is maybe frustration or anger that he's not being uh, accepted uh, the way he needs to feel or the way he wants to be accepted, right? This is a memory. It's very colorful and very vivid because our memories arguably are gilded memories, right? They are more over the top than they actually were in reality, right? We remember things fondly or we, we remember things horrifically, but it's kind of rare that we remember things and it's just, eh, you know, we either enjoyed it or we hated it, right? And so this has got a lot of complexity going on. We got the colors playing games with us. Uh, it's all a lot of fo focus except Christian Slater. And he is tainted with passion and frustration. He's half lit and he's asking, why don't you love me? Very good. What about here? Symmetry is the low-hanging fruit. Yes, it is, but it means more than just balance right here. In fact, <laughs> what do you see? They're in the same position and are taking up basically most of the same amount of framing. It's because he's kind of talking to himself he's talking to his alter ego and then he has him on the bright side um and since there's no mirror they kind of framed it as one the alter ego which is the imaginary on the left talking to him and he's receiving that you said something very key one word you said which under underlies the whole shot mirroring is that what it is mirror. yeah mirroring. mirror this is from the first episode before we know that Mr. Robot on the left is the alter ego of Crazy Elliot on the right. And the author is trying to foreshadow the possibility that these two characters are the same guy. In this scene, they're talking to each other, but it has this odd center element right here. It's out of focus in the foreground. It's dividing up the whole composition equally in half. And he's on the right side and he's on the left side and everything looks the same from the left to the right side. We got all this convergence right here leading us to this autofocus weird line that says this guy's looking in the mirror at himself as an alter ego. But we don't know any of this yet. Right now in the season, it's like 15 minutes into the show, into the whole series. 
and they're already trying to tell us that there's something up. How about this one? Very good, Brian. How about this one? This is a little bit easier and it's a little less um, intellectually steeped. Well, that's more like color theory, right? With like the blue and then the yellow. Here is Elliot's warm insular reality but he can't cope with certain details in his reality so he punched the mirror to change the perspective but it's warm and comforting here this is when Elliot's on his meds and it's hard and cold and blue when he's off his meds this is the outside world if he leaves his apartment and he doesn't take his medicine he goes out into the cold hard world where he's always depressed. Blue, literally the word blue can translate to depressed. And in here he's warm and safe and medicated, except when he looks in the mirror and he's reminded that he's nuts. So he bang, he fisted the mirror and smashed his image, distorted the truth. How about here? Anybody want to take a stab at it? This one is a little bit harder, I think. This is Elliot's arguably ex-girlfriend. Not quite it. Yeah, at this moment, I think they're finally decided they're not really an item. She did something to help Elliot expedite his Mr. Robot plan. And she knows it was wrong, but she did it for her own reasons, which had something, nothing to do with Elliot and more to do with her own personal backstory. But she did something that she's not sure she should have done. She is at work. She's looking out at the city and she knows that in a few hours, Elliot's going to do something that's going to take the grid out. Everything is going to go down. He's going to break the whole thing. And she's looking out there, out the window, and she sees a reflection of herself. She's judging herself and the actions that she's taken and trying to decide whether or not they were justified. And she's also looking out at the world that's about to be broken, and she helped to do it. And her office is at a company that will stand to lose a great deal from what Elliot is doing and she helped and she's still working there. So it's the shadows over here, the bad company and they call it Evil Corp in the show, right? She works at Evil Corp and she has just done something to take them down and the entire grid in the process. She did it for revenge and she's questioning her own motives for doing it. How's that for going deep in the weeds for meaning, right? But it's all there if you want. Okay, one of the things we say about rhetoric and the study of the English language and literacy and words and how they have meaning and they have subtext, it is said that just like beauty is in the eye of the beholder, rhetoric is in the eye of the reader. So if, if it means all of those things to me, and I can pose an argument to you to justify every premise I've made about this image, it is, from my point of view, true. You might look at that image and not see those things, okay? It doesn't mean that you, I'm right and you're wrong. It just means at your level of engagement, you don't see what I see. But if you understand my premise and you understand uh, each one of my um, each one of my assertions and you can apply those assertions to a theory from composition or framing uh, in, a, in a filmmaking sense and you can say yeah I could see why you're making that argument then I have made a valid argument right and then it does mean what I say it means if I'm the DP of this movie it clearly means that do you see how this is working?
Here's another one. This is pretty simple. He's center frame, so maybe he's conflicted again. And then he's like in the bed, so maybe he feels trapped because he's totally covered up to his head. Where's the camera? Directly above him. Looking down, right? So he feels small. From a... Who is seeing Elliot in his bed? We are. Do we know more than Elliot knows? No. No? Why wouldn't we? Like, as the audience, don't we know things from other characters' perspectives that he might not know? Yeah, we do. In this show, we do. And everything that Elliot knows, he tells to the camera in an odd aside every episode. He turns to the camera, just like Kevin Spacey in House of Cards, and he tells us what's on his mind. So Elliot tells us everything he knows through psychosis. And we see things even Elliot doesn't know. That makes us omnipotent, right? If we are omnipotent, omnipotent means? To know everything. All knowing. If we are all knowing and we are from high looking down at the world and we see man. who Are, are we God? We are God in this narrative. How's that for reach? <laughs> now, yeah, that's one way to interpret this frame. The other way to interpret this frame is this is Elliot's apartment. And what is it? It's dark. It is womb-like. We're seeing him as a little embryo of a man. He's on his meds, heavy. He's so weak on his meds. The only way to calm this guy down and keep him from blowing up the world is to heavily medicate him. And he does it to himself because he knows he's his own worst enemy. So when he's in his room, all comfy and cinched up to the neck with his covers like you do as a child when you're afraid of the dark. He's afraid of the light, this guy. He can't go outside and be normal because he's nuts and he'll blow things up. So instead he's inside under the covers, heavily medicated in the dark, right? And he's a little, he's back in the womb, a little embryo, right? So it's a very interesting composition to kind of help us understand how this guy feels. He's not- Well, in that, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but in that, in that um, shot, it's actually, I'm pretty sure if I'm not mistaken, it's taking place in like season two. And that's yeah. when, that's when um, at this moment, he, he's, he's saying that he's been staying at his mother's. Right. But what actually has happened is he, we find out later in the season that he was actually in a prison like this entire time. He basically, he sent himself to jail to kind of keep him boxed in. So but but it's all like this is all front so to the right. audience he even says it that he's he was keeping us out of the information so in that way how does that how would that relate to this this composition okay so one nerd to another what does so he was in jail right can he accept that fact at face value This is his gilded impression of where he was. He was being right. taken care of. He was taken off the street and prevented from doing himself or anyone else any harm. So this is his image of what it meant to be incarcerated. He was prevented from and protected from himself at the same time. And they cared for him and they medicated him and they watched over him, right? and they kept him safe, but it didn't last long, right? So this is, a, this is a, an impressionistic point of view of how Elliot spent his time in jail. He actually valued his time being locked up because it kept him from going nuts because he doesn't trust himself when he doesn't have any restraints. Yeah. <laughs> so that's like, the glossy version of this and for folks who are really into the story like you clearly um this is metaphorical mm -hmm. very good i'm psyched about that 
What about this one? Could it be like the four quadrants? Cause there's kind of the bar in the middle and then she's sort of in like the lines are in the center. Maybe. She's smack dab on the right. Give me some other stuff. Maybe st something um, tropes that we haven't discussed in this session yet, but that might apply. Is that bar in the middle of the frame? I was just about to say that. Yeah. Mm, no, it's it's Not more quite. off to the off to the side a little bit. It's a little bit off center, right? We used to use an expression uh, when we were back in the old days, when we were really drunk or we thought somebody was really dumb, we would say they were half a bubble off a plum, right? It's a carpenter's level joke referring to framing a house, right? Um, but if you're half a bubble off a plum, in other words, if you're on the level, the bubble is right in the middle of the, of the window you look at on a, on, a, on a carpenter's level to find all, out if it's off kilter or not. And that vertical is just off center, just enough to bother you to say, what's up with that? It's, it would typically be in the middle. If I'm reading these guys correctly, they should have put the bar in the middle, but they didn't, it's slightly off center. And then what else is going on? There's another principle at work here. What do you see happening? Do you see converging lines leading towards a vanishing point? Where are they leading? Her head or behind her head? Right behind her head. They're not leading to the sun in the middle of the horizon and that vertical line isn't in the center either. They're going right behind her head or into her head and her head is off center. She's off center. What else? You ever hear the term rose colored glasses? They're not rose colored that I can see necessarily. I think they were though. Um, she's got her glasses on, man. She's not, she's checked out. That's it. She's high. She's decided her brother can go take a long walk down a short pier. She's done with it. She's tripping. She's got her glasses on so that she can see the world the way she needs to in her perspective so she can get her own mind right. And we know that she's inebriated because that vertical line that would normally be straight is bent. She's what we would call bent. <laughs> she's self-medicating. She's like, I can't take this anymore. I have got to check out right now. She self-medicated and she told her brother to go take a hike and she hopped on the subway and she says, I'm leaving, I'm out of it, I'm out, right? She's quitting the group, she's quitting the plan, she doesn't want any part of it, right? And she's all in her head. So all of the converging lines are going right to her. She's all in her head and she's done with it. She's checked out. How about this one? This is, I think, from the first episode. Certainly from the first season. The depth of field is really shallow. Really shallow. So what are we what are we supposed to look at? At uh, Elliot, that's his name? Elliot. They clearly want us to look at Elliot. Elliot is what's Elliot doing? What's it talk about his posture? He's kind of slouched. And at least this time he's looking the right way off frame. He's looking, you know, on the opposite side of the frame that he's um, on. Cause he's more right, but he's at least looking off to the left instead of short framing. But what's odd about that? That he doesn't usually, so. What's he, tell me about his look. How's he throwing that look? I mean, like, speculating he kind of looks suspicious he's looking down a little bit yeah and over his shoulder i gotta go i know i should be going that way 
but I'm going this way. And he's half lit. This is when he was still at Evil Corp and he was still working there, but he got the idea, I'm gonna put a Raspberry Pi in the server and crash the server. Actually, this is Evil Corp, it's the company that he worked for. And he crashed the servers at the company that he worked for to see if he could do it and if it would play a part in a bigger plan. And so he goes, I know how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna put a Raspberry Pi in the server and I'm gonna to have to do it in a way that's clever and it's not on the up and up. And so he's looking, he's kind of looking at the, the hard drive thinking, how am I going to get this? You know, how am I going to do this? But he's looking into the frame, almost like, almost like I need to be doing this, but I'm doing the other thing. I should be behaving myself, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to crash the company's server, right? I'm half lit. So I'm up to no good. I'm looking in the right direction. I'm supposed to be doing better but I'm not because I'm facing the other way. I'm clearly going the other way. So maybe I'm lying to myself or, uh, you know, whatever, however you want to interpret that. But in other words, he's not, he's still not flying right. He's still not on the up and up. How about here? What do you say, Zach? It's from the same same season as the bird's eye view. Do you remember this scene? Yeah, this is when he's sitting on the bench um, across from the basketball court. Yeah. Yeah. And what's going on? I, f I forget the guy's name, but doesn't he like? Doesn't he like try to? do something or try to mess with his operations. So he gets, that's why he's got this gun pointed to his head because it's one of his lackeys or something. This is when Elliot decided that the best way for him to live his life was to stay medicated, live with his mom. His mom will look after him and make sure he doesn't stray off the path. Um, he is, I think this is before he goes, because he goes to jail at the end of this season. So I, it's before he goes to jail. He wants to be on the up and up. And I believe that this guy, this black guy is also an alter ego, but he's not as powerful as Mr. Robot. This guy represents the, the impulse that, that Elliot has to be a hacker in the first place. Mr. Robot is, ex, is exploiting all of Elliot's capabilities to really commit some damage to what he perceives as, probably rightfully so, what he perceives as all of the injustices in the world that are driven by finance and greed, right? Mr. Robot has a lofty ambition to tear down the, the mechanisms of power. And this guy just wants Elliot to hack into a system to make a few bucks. So I think this guy is another less powerful alter ego that is running around in Elliot's head. Because at this moment, Elliot says, I'm just going to stay medicated and live with mom and my life will be fine. And then this guy appears right behind him with the gun and says, either you do what I want or I'm going to blow your head off right now. And Elliot's like, go ahead. I might be better off. So at, at that moment, Eddie, Elliot being in the center of the frame doesn't have a choice to make. He's already made it. Go ahead and blow my head off, man, because I think, I'd be better off dead. And the alter ego is like, come on, man, one more, one more, you know, don't, don't abandon me now. Right. And he draws him back in. And I'm not clear on this. If they ever sorted out because I, I haven't seen the last season, I don't know if they ever sorted this character out or not uh, to anyone's satisfaction. But I think the consensus is he was another one of Elliot's personalities. I mean, that's that's an interesting idea. Might be worth looking into, do a little research. All right, how about this one? Who's his woman, Zach? That's his uh, psychiatrist, just can't remember her name. Yeah. I haven't seen the show in like two years. Oh, it's isn't it a... Crystal or something? 
I, I don't remember her name her name either, but I'm laughing because it's it's similar to another scenario in another very famous TV series. The Sopranos, where Tony Soprano, the gangster, goes to therapy on a weekly basis. And he has that thing going on with um, what's her name, the actress. Um, oh, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it's the same kind of circumstance, right? Um, in the Sopranos, Tony Soprano goes in under the under the um, uh, he goes in putting on airs that he's not really a bad guy, so that his therapist won't judge him too harshly. Um, and he doesn't really have faith in the therapy system as a whole. This is Mr. Robot, though. So what's happening here? Is it just Elliot and he's like imagining that Mr. Robot is the one confronting her? Because clearly he's not real. Who's well, in the, in, the sh in the show, sorry. No, go ahead. Should, no, so in the ahead. show, um, th this is the moment when the therapist like basically knows that Mr. Robot is, is like a person that he talks to or that he can like jump into basically. So Elliot, Mr. When Mr. Robot takes over, he takes over Elliot's body and basically becomes him. So he's speaking through Elliot's body. So when she asks to see him, he comes out and does his spiel. So we just see him as Mr. Robot, but she's obviously seeing him as Elliot. Yeah, it's just easier. Right. It's just okay. easier to comprehend that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is not literal. This is so that we can keep our perspective of the story straight. When Elliot is nuts, he's Christian Slater. He's Mr. Robot. She always sees Elliot. She's the doctor. She knows he's nuts. He doesn't really know he's nuts. He knows he's schizophrenic, but he, he doesn't understand that Mr. Robot can take over what, what his actions are. And in this particular moment, who's in charge? Mr. Robot. So he's like no longer at odds with himself. He's picked one and it's the dark side because they're backlit and it's very dark framing and he's above her. Tell me about this Mr. Robot or this Mr. Robot. I should say, tell me about this Elliot or this Elliot. This he's Elliot what? is what? He, in terms of power, he's what? Dominant or recessive? Recessive? Taking drugs, trying to be, trying to be mellow, man. He's not, he's not looking for trouble. This Mr. Robot is aggressive. And it's the first time he's been aggressive to his therapist. And his therapist is like, holy crap, this guy actually is a danger to possibly me and possibly to himself. He's not a simple schizophrenic anymore. He's now capable of extreme behavior, right? This is the first time I think we really get a sense that Mr. Robot has a violent side. He's always been kind of coercive and subtle like the devil speaking in your ear you know, not really taking responsibility, but goading you on to do his bidding for him, using you as a tool of his own animus. But now he's just no holds barred. He's going after the counselor. You stay away from Elliot. He's mine, right? He's now become like a demon possessed of Elliot's whole persona. I'm in charge now and you better watch yourself or I'm going to take care of you permanently. And that's basically what's happening here. He's threatening the therapist. And, and he has found out stuff about her that he thinks is not cool. And so there's a situation here that we haven't really talked much about yet, and that is the, the emphasis of the silhouette in composition. When somebody is seen as a silhouette, they're seen as evil or a liar. Um, they can be conflicted in a big way because we no longer see them as themselves. So they've been consumed by their passion or consumed by evil. They're a liar. 
they are false, right? He's not real. And she has not been truthful with Elliot. She's been lying to him about some stuff. And so they're both seen in silhouette because for the first time, and, and Mr. Robot is picking up on it. He's like, you've been lying to Elliot. You've been lying that he can get better. You've been lying that his issue uh, is, is not dangerous and that I'm going to hurt him somehow. You've been lying to him. And they're both silhouettes because neither one of them has been truthful with Elliot. So they're both a silhouette. Because look at the room. The room is lit. So why are they dark? Unless... Sam Ishmael wanted you to make some value judgments about both of these characters in this moment. He wants you to think of them as both being false. He's not the real Elliot, and she's been lying to Elliot, the patient. Does that make sense? Check me, Zach. Bingo. Copy that. Thank you very much. How about this one? He's half lit as well. And he's on the right side. He's looking to the short side of the screen. So he's also not exactly like a good guy. And he looks just suspicious, but that just might be me. Well, he's on the lamb. He is the one of the chief executive officers of Evil Corp. And he has a violent alter ego himself, which doesn't really come out much. But when it does, he does some real damage. And he got drunk at a party and he killed somebody. So he went into hiding, right? And he is trying to thwart Elliot as Elliot the hacker who's going to do something to the servers at Evil Corp and crash their financial portfolio and crash the stock market. He's dealing with Elliot the computer hacker and he doesn't realize that Elliot is also a psychopathic Mr. Robot, right? But this is him in hiding, hiding from, oh God, in this moment, I believe, check me, Zach, but in this moment, I think he finds out that Elliot knows where he's hiding and how to find him. And he's afraid that he's going to get found before he can thwart Elliot's plan to crash the servers at, at Evil Corp. And so he's worried that Mr. Robot is going to come and find him in his hideout. And he's hiding in the shadows. And yes, he's conflicted because he's committed a murder himself. He's on the lam. Um, he has also, you know, he's a crooked executive, so he's done a lot of bad things. He knows Evil Corp is a bad company, but he doesn't necessarily want to scuttle the ship that's been making him a ton of money. Um, and he doesn't want to be caught by Elliot because he thinks Elliot's going to kill him. So this guy and looking off frame in the wrong direction. Season three, right, Zach? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it. Beginning of season three when they sneak into, um, it was the client of the original company, I believe, where there was a clone of the original company server that he crashed in the first season with the Raspberry Pi. And he's going to go in and see if he can thwart that clone of the original server so that nobody can figure out what he did and how he did it. They're breaking into another company in the beginning of the third season. And I think this one is pretty simple. I, I just think that it's him in a, in, a, in a thoughtful sort of pensive moment where he's reflecting on what has led him to this point. And so he's not hopeful because he may not pull this off and he may not be able to crash the clone of the server. Um, and so he could get caught. Uh, his bigger plan might not ever come to fruition. Um, it's, a, it's a moment of, of, um, of 
importance for Elliot in terms of his long-term goals, um, but he has to get through this the short-term moment first. And I think it's just the you know the the cameraman is trying to show us how he just doesn't feel he just feels out of sorts about the whole thing he's his confidence is at a low point i think that's really all that's that's really happening in this in this moment am i ever going to pull this off or am i just wasting my time is any of this really worth all of the effort i'm putting in am i doing the right thing Last one. There's lines on the top that lead to the back window. Are those back windows or are they TV screens? Oh, I don't know. Now that you say that, they kind of look like screens. I think they're TV screens. I think it's the NASDAQ ticker. <laughs> so this is the end of season three and this is the world that Elliot, Elliot hath wrought. This is the same thing as the organization that was going to blow up the credit card com companies at the end of, of Fight Club. This is his Edward Norton reflection moment where he looks at the world he has created and how it has taken over a life of its own. And he has set forces into motion that he's not sure he still controls. And they're all trying to please Mr. Robot. They're all computer hackers. They're all in on the big plan. They're all working hard to make it happen for Elliot because they worship him as some manifested, uh, you know, deified person, right? And they, he has, I, I think this is where he crashes the NASDAQ, right, at the end of the season three, which is why his sister got on the bus, to the thing to head out of town. She's like, oh, crap, I, I was just a party to something really big and scary, and I don't know if I was right to help him or not, right? And he's sitting here going, well, that happened. <laughs> you know, we did that, and I hope it was the right thing, you know? And I can't believe, he goes, how am I going to control all these people now? What are they going to want now that this is over? How am I going to keep feeding this fervor, right? And so they're using color and they're using converging lines to show us, look at the converging lines of the people sitting at the long table too. It's all leading us to these two screens right here as they watch it's like watching the ball drop at New Year's Eve, right? Three, two, one, crash, and all of the stocks just start plummeting, and all of the money just starts evaporating into thin air, and they're cheering, and they're hooting and hollering, and he's going, should I have done this? <laughs> he's in warm kind of loving light right here in a in, a, in an odd moment of clarity, and he's looking around at the room going, oh my God, I'm responsible for all of this. I've built this revolution. Because Could the green lighting be reminiscent of the fact that they're like messing with money? Could be, yeah, the green could, because the green is where these screens are and that's the NASDAQ, right? He started the scene over here, frame right. He walks into the room and he looks around and then the steady cam follows him down one side of the table as he's looking at everybody and up the other side and they're cheering and they're seeing him come in and they're acknowledging him and high-fiving him and doing their things on the laptops and they're all, they're all focused on the game, right? And he's just looking at everything going, oh crap, this is more than I bargained for. And I think, you know, you could very well be correct about this signifying the money. And so if that's true, then the blue has to mean something. What does the blue mean to you? Blue is always like blue light represents technology. They could, I think it like, it's just about the fact that they're a group of people who are all like collected under one specific skill. In a world where this is perceived as the only true power, they proved that was false by using the ideology of this. If I'm poor and hungry and smart, technology can trump your financial power. I can bring your financial power to its knees through technology. 
and technology right now is very inexpensive, meaning the peasants can certainly take down the empire if the empire isn't more careful. And that was what his whole motive was in the beginning was to try to, by using evil means, he was trying to do something that he perceived to be an ultimate good, which is to reset, restructure the world where money is not the underlying factor that determines right or wrong, power or weak, right? Healthy or sick, live or die, right? Money should not be the, the deciding factor in any of those ideological conundrums. And so he used something that is considered an antithesis of money, but on the same side ethically as money, technology. Technology is also seen in, in a certain light by certain people as not being the true wholesomeness that it represents. So it's like two wrongs. Can two wrongs come together and make a right? I don't know. I'm going to find out. Could his posture also, because it's like that other shot you said where he's like facing one way, but his head is going back to an alternate um, goal, like the one where he's. He's thinking about forward. running. He's thinking about but, running. He, he, this this scares him because he he doesn't have any control over it anymore. The only way he it's kind of like the Joker at the end of the movie Joker where he's going to jail and he's he's in the taxi cab and he's driving down the street and the people are riding in the streets. And he said that they're doing this for me. I did this, they're doing this for me. And, and at the same time he goes, I had no idea I could, I wielded this much power, right? They're burning the city to the ground. And then they flip the cab over or the cop car and they pull him out and they, they, put him on a pedestal they offer him up his apotheosis it's his moment and he stands on the hood of the car and he's behold your god right this is all symbology right and so it's in the pictures in the script and in the performance right and can you imagine the ending scene of joker being having any power at all if the images weren't so dramatic and if the choreography wasn't so precise. And in this shot right here, even though you haven't seen the series, this shot is, is amazing. It's a huge Steadicam shot. And it's got all kinds of information in it as that camera goes through the crowd and it sees Elliot and it sees close-ups of monitors and people working on computers. And, and, the, and it's just, it's the camera as us, as, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, behold, I am become death, right? I have become the destroyer of worlds. It's the camera is looking at this, uh, everything now in the context of, whoa, <laughs> you know? And it's a really interesting moment. This is art in real time. Um, that's why, you know, I went from in the very beginning resisting the idea of this show. And by the end of it, I was a fanatical advocate of, everything that um everything these guys were doing this is todd i forget his last name todd um i feel really bad too because he's he did a wonderful job with this you know this is all well thought out cinematography this is not accidental this isn't random they just didn't show up in this set one day and say okay we can do this or do that this is thought out and it's not just for this episode. It represents a dedicated approach to the cinematography every episode, every season, so that the meanings are specific and nothing is um, discounted. Everything is deliberate, right? And it's the opposite. The other kind of cinematography is just, well, we'll just take what we get, you know? Oh, I won't try to light everything. I prefer natural is a lie and a cop-out. Anybody who says I prefer not to light my movies is full of crap. That means they can't do it, right? Unless it's a certain individual who's already demonstrated that they can light movies, and then it might be an existential problem that they have, right? But anybody who says, I just like to use natural light, I think it's more valid or it's more real or true. No, because everything in this season, 
all all four seasons of this show was deliberately lit deliberately and dramatically built to make you feel a certain way think a certain thing so they can reveal details when they need to entertain you along the way and then satisfy you at the very end with a with a finale that has meaning and emphasis and ties the whole premise of the show together um, and it gives you an aha moment kind of right that's really powerful use of an art form so having said that i've run out of time more or less um, but i would like to if you have anything to add any questions any thoughts anything that you want to offer up in in favor of this presentation please let me know uh, we've got a couple of minutes we could talk about it um be happy to uh and remember you know these are my these are my interpretations of all of this information right so i'm using my experience my knowledge and and my point of view to analyze and deconstruct these images you're going to work from similar but also slightly different points of view so you might not see what i have offered to you as analysis if you don't what do you see right if you don't see what i see why do you see anything at all or do you not see any of the compositional uh tenants at work here am i making mountains out of molehills for instance I had a question about what you were saying about literacy. Yeah. Like when you're talking about like um, literacy in literature and then even in like visual, I guess, a lot of um, what like scholars say is that there's, you know, you can conjecture all you want about the meaning behind things, but then you also talk about like um, the eye of the author and like the death of the author. So when it comes to literacy in film, I guess like, would it be considered um, just an opinion based on what the audience thinks, or is the true literacy understanding the intention of the cinematographer and the director and the creator? Like, I know that it's all based on opinion and, you know, it's a subjective art, but, you know, literacy, is it objective or is it more subjective? I, th I think it's both. And until we are through the looking glass, we are in the midst of a paradigm shift. It's not over. So we are at the confluence of tradition and digital possibility. And there's a shakedown happening, right? Some people think of literacy strictly in terms of texts, books, articles, written communications, right? But we clearly have more ways to communicate. We have symbols, semiotics, the interpretation of symbols and what they mean. We have different languages. We have linguistic relativity. One word means one thing to you and a different word to me. John de Borman, reflection, thinking. American would say, she's thinking about the guy on the corner. The Englishman says, she's reflecting on what she sees, right? And in that, and in that difference, in that linguistic relativity lies the interpretation of seeing the events in the glass and seeing her through the glass and seeing both things at the same time right so think of think of literacy now as communication in all of its forms and which literacy do you subscribe to visual textual symbolic uh spoken performative right people say that music has literacy can you read music? Music has phrasing, it has notes, which you could say are the words and the building blocks of communication, musically speaking, and that a musical composition can speak to you in here, elicit emotion, make you think of things, give you visual imagery in your head. Do you ever watch MTV and see videos in your head? Does music ever make you think of visual stimulus? It does to me. I can listen to the radio and hear a song and see a music video happening in my head. Not necessarily the one associated with the song that was actually offered as marketing 
on VH1 or MTV, but a visual composition that I'm constructing it from my own memory, from my own experience, and applying those images to the emotional response of the music. That is communication. So literacy has to now take on more forms, right? It can't simply be the script is lit literacy, knowing how to read the script and interpret the script. The visuals are also saying something. And if the visuals are saying something that's counterintuitive to the script, then that's going to represent confusion for your audience. So the two things have to be in harmony. They have to be supporting one another. The visuals need to be such that they're speaking in the same themes and tones as the script and the performance is relying on that script to interpret and demonstrate for the audience. It's all gotta be firing on all eight cylinders in the same direction. Otherwise you have a, a, a problem and your film might be deemed as not so good or boring or just okay, or I didn't get it, right? And your audience leaves the theater unsatisfied instead of happy they spent 1750 right so this is what we're talking about and all of it is deliberate all of it is informed decision making it's not random it doesn't just happen all by itself and this is why people go to film school if they want to be educated in the how and the why of this thing instead of just taking for granted that they can parrot the movements or behaviors of somebody else that taught them how to light or shoot or whatever and they don't really understand the deeper meanings behind all of this so this is where it's good to you know be in a film program that teaches you theory and execution and doesn't show one in preference to the other that they're both given equal time and when you put them both together you get a very successful learning experience where you're not only taught how to fish but you're feeding yourself and you're catching the fish and you're and you're living well as a result of it right it's not it, you know it's not one-sided and all of this so you can argue why why bother you know interpreting all of this at all well because if you're not somebody is especially in hollywood if that's where your goal is to end up as a filmmaker in a major market like that if you don't think people are thinking this deeply about it, you are, you have your head in the sand. Because this is trade craft. This is what the professionals are thinking about. This is what distinguishes you from a whole field of, of adequate technicians, right? Is, you know, how clearly do you see the big picture of how it all ties together? So I'm arguing that literacy no longer simply means text. It means communication and mass, and you decide what mode you work in. I work in visual. So, well, my trade is visual. My credentials are textual. So that's an odd animal, isn't it? Any other thoughts on that uh, whole deal? It was a rather long-winded one today, but I got to give you something to think about while you're on the beach during spring break. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? No, just uh, find some time to watch season four. I can now. I got the fire stick. It is on my list, baby. I will be El Bingerino next week while you guys are having spring break. I'm going to catch up on my Mr. Robot. That's right. I got the Amazon Fire Stick and I am ready to go. I got it in my already in my uh, viewing, uh, you know, flagged as, you know, on my list of things to watch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn then? Can I get a second on that? All right, folks, enjoy your spring break. Thank you so much for sticking with me for the duration of this long-winded uh, lecture, but I hope that it helped you, informed you, entertained you uh, in some way. Um, have fun next week. Be safe, please. Social distance, wear a mask. 
and I will see you happy and healthy uh, in two weeks. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.